Welcome to another edition of Zeek in Action. I'm your host, Richard Baitlick, and in this series of videos, we address topics that are of interest to those who use the Zeek application and programming language to address a variety of defensive network security challenges. And in this video, we're going to be talking about the intricacies of wireless monitoring. Now, the reason I'm recording this video is that I've noticed people asking a few times in Slack or in other, uh, other areas, can I use Zeek for wireless monitoring? And that sort of begs the, the bigger question of how do I monitor wireless traffic for any type of network security monitoring purpose? And if you do any kind of sort of on the surface research for this, you'll get some sort of answer that uh, that involves, oh, just run monitor mode on Linux and sometimes Windows because you'll see everything. And in my, uh, in my experience, this has not been the case. And I wanted to find out if that experience held up in 2021. Uh, in other words, is there a feasible solution for defensive monitoring purposes? And I want to sort of provide a, a couple of assumptions that I brought to the table here. Um, the first one is that if we're going to be doing any type of what we're calling wireless monitoring, uh, we have to ask what is the traffic pattern we're looking at? And I think when most people think of wireless monitoring, they're not thinking of north-south traffic from a wireless client to the internet. They're thinking more along the lines of, of lateral movement, so wireless to wireless. Now, if you could watch wireless traffic itself and get that north-south behavior, that would be a bonus as well. But I think most people, when they're, they're thinking about monitoring a wireless network, they want to be able to see wireless systems talking to other wireless systems. So that's sort of one, uh, one assumption that I bring to this. And the second assumption that I bring to it is that you want to be able to see at least a good portion of the traffic. Uh, you don't want to have massive gaps in the amount of traffic that you're looking at. Because under those circumstances, you can't be sure that what you're seeing is representative at all of what's happening on the network. We don't necessarily have to have perfection because there's plenty of network security monitoring uh, inst instantiations where you're only seeing some of the activity and some is better than none. But I think we could agree that if we're doing some type of defensive monitoring, we want to be able to get uh, access to the most traffic possible. And then using other methods, whether it's looking at transaction logs or using some type of filter or whatever other workflow or technical approach, you narrow down the amount of traffic you look at. You don't want a feature of the underlying capture system to be, well, we're just going to lose most of the traffic. Uh, <laughs> I just don't find that to be acceptable. So with those two assumptions or, or, or sort of understandings, let's proceed. Now, the way I decided to uh, approach this problem was to try to make it as easy as possible for anyone watching this video to duplicate my results. Because if I were to come up with some elaborate or obscure method to approach this problem and nobody else can replicate it, then what's the point? So I wanted to make it as easy as possible for someone to download software, plug in hardware, run commands, and see if they get the same results, better results, worse results, or even to be able to provide an alternative method to do this. Because if someone's watching this video and they have the answer, uh, it fulfills the requirements that we set, I, that's great. I would love to hear about it. And I think a lot of our viewers would too and other people in the network security monitoring community. So with that said, I approached this problem, uh, basically the first approach I took was to use Kali Linux because I knew that uh, Kali Linux had support, uh, native support for so many of the wireless assessment tools that people usually associate with some type of uh, wireless security. Uh, now, I was able to have some success on Kali Linux, but it didn't meet my standard for just being as simple as possible. And that's when I decided to turn to Parrot Security or Parrot OS uh, because it had plug and play essentially support for the hardware that I decided to use for this project. So I uh, used a Parrot uh, VirtualBox image downloaded from the URL here at parrotsec.org 
and that is the operating system that I'm using for my uh, wireless capture. I ended up installing uh, a version of Parrot uh, 4.11.2 uh, running inside a VirtualBox 6122 as shown here uh, with Windows 10 underneath. For the hardware I decided uh, to use, I bought two wireless NICs, and this NIC, uh, not only was it basically the number one contender per the Aircrack NG um, FAQ, but it was also the easiest to use. Uh, this is an Alpha AWUS 036 ACH, and uh, there's also a fairly uh, nice set of videos available online from a variety of of uh, authors who talk about how to use this NIC um, with various tools under Kali Linux um, and for other sort of offensive minded security purposes. And uh, as you can see in the lower right hand corner, this, uh, this alpha NIC, it's a, it's a external USB NIC. Um, it's considered to be uh, the best for wireless assessments. So in other words, performing offensive actions, and we'll see why that's important in a second. I didn't run into any issues as far as the kernels being unstable. Um, so this is the device that I bought. Um, I bought two NICs, like I said, but this is the one that I think I'm gonna be keeping going forward and I'll be shipping the other one back because uh, it's uh, redundant at this point. Okay, so just to show you a little bit about this setup that I'm using, uh, again, Parrot OS 4.11. Um, here's the kernel that's that's supported. And uh, importantly, if you want to try to duplicate my results, I made no changes to this distribution. I didn't uh, update the operating system. I didn't update any packages. Uh, it essentially worked with maybe one minor caveat that I'll, I'll talk about uh, briefly. But uh, essentially, if you were to download this virtual machine, uh, run it on VirtualBox, and do what I do, you should get the same results. Now, we all know computers are, uh, some, they're perceived as being deterministic, and they end up being non-deterministic, because you could get that random photon that goes through your equipment and changes one bit and everything's different. But uh, for the most part, this is about as scientific as we can get, I would argue, as far as trying to replicate results. Now, when you simply boot up this operating system and you do an ifconfig-a, you'll see that uh, my system had an interface that I had bridged to the, the outside world uh, and it had a loopback interface. And it had no wireless interface at this point because I had not connected the wireless NIC. So I'll show you what I did to do that. Using VirtualBox, I clicked here on the devices and then USB, and I selected my Realtek NIC, and that connected it to the operating system. Now, this is a, a device that supports USB 3.0. Um, I did not enable USB 3.0 in my device settings. I don't think that really had any effect whatsoever because I was able to, to uh, do what I needed to do here. Um, I may try enabling USB uh, 3.0 to see if that changes things, but uh, for the most part, I think uh, we have what we need. Now, when you, after you connect the NIC, the uh, operating system notices that it's there, and using a dmessage command, you can see that uh, the kernel has recognized that there's a new USB device plugged in. It's an 802.11n uh, 802.11n NIC. Uh, you can see the uh, d uh, device drivers that are there. And th that's what's nice about Parrot OS. These things are already compiled. Uh, they're already installed. They're ready to go. I didn't have to do any of the external additions that I, I was doing under Kali Linux when I was trying that version. So uh, again, just to make it easier for someone to try to duplicate what I have, there we go. Um, and once I did that, once I plugged in the NIC, uh, you'll see that I have a new wireless device. And this is kind of one thing that I'm not a big fan of. The, uh, the NIC gets renamed from uh, WLAN 0 to this really complicated uh, WLX, etc. nickname. And I suppose that's good for scripts if you're doing something where you need a specific NIC all the time. 
Um, but as far as having to type commands in a concise manner, that is kind of a pain. But um, as you can see, that the uh, there is now a wireless NIC recognized by the operating system, and it worked out of the box with Parrot OS. Okay, now. I decided for the purposes of this discussion to attack a wireless network that was completely under my control and for which I, I obviously, since I knew, I knew it, uh, or I was running it, I knew the uh, passphrase for it, the key. Um, so in an, also to speed up the process of performing a dictionary attack against the wireless network, I created a so-called dictionary file with the... Um, with the key of good life, which is the default um, key for this little tiny, uh, it's like sub-consumer grade uh, wireless uh, access point that I have. I probably should have thrown an ex uh, a picture in there of this thing. Uh, you can see down here it's listed as this GLAR150-2BE. Um, if you Google that, you'll see exactly what kind of little device this thing is. Um, so what we're doing here is we're testing to see if the wireless support offered by my setup is sufficient enough to crack the uh, key associated with this network. And uh, both Kali and ParadoS ship with a script called Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi is a pretty nice little uh, application that bundles a lot of other uh, tools into essentially a single command. And you'll see videos on, on on YouTube of how to hack somebody's network with one command. And this is essentially it. Right? You, you basically tell Wi-Fi an interface to look at, and if you want to pass it a a different dictionary file other than the one that's packaged with it, you you do that, and it starts looking for wireless networks, and then tries to uh, find out the key for them. So in this example, um, there are many networks that that were identified uh, in the surrounding area, um, but I am simply going to pay attention to the network that I set up specifically for this, this test, and this is this uh, Good Life network here. Um, <clears throat> incidentally, the setup for the wireless network looks like this. I didn't just attack the access point, because I noticed that in some other videos as well, someone would set up literally just an access point and then uh, they would attack that ax they would attack the Wi-Fi network, but there were no systems actually on it. Um, sometimes they would ha maybe they would have their phone attached to it, but I decided to set up a couple laptops um, and have them doing something while attached to this target wireless network. So what I have here is on the left, um, I've got two what are they Windows Seven boxes? It looks like um, the left one is pinging the right one, um, and I've, I've got to zoom in on the screenshot here, and you'll see that there's some request times out and general failures and, and other error messages. Those are caused by the Wi-Fi script uh, de-authenticating each of the systems from the wireless network. And it's doing that because it's trying to knock them off the network, and then as they reconnect to the network, um, the attack software powered by Aircrack NG or Aerodump NG in the background is trying to capture the handshake so it'll have something to brute force, get the key, and then provide that to the, the wireless assessor. And we'll see why that's all important a little bit later. So we've got traffic here being uh, generated between these two systems. That also becomes a little bit important, more important later when we're trying to see, well, uh, can we actually capture this network traffic for purposes of, of monitoring? Now this is the rest of the output from that Wi-Fi attack, and you can see that these two laptops were discovered. Here are their MAC addresses, and uh, Wi-Fi reports seeing that it's captured the handshake, and it saves a copy of the traffic associated with that handshake to this uh, .cap file, which I love. Anytime you've got a tool generating a PCAP, it's uh, great for, for any of our network security monitoring. Um, <clears throat> You'll see that it cracks the WPA handshake. The, the appreciated key is good life, as we as we said, um, and it produces this crack.json file where um, it will show us not only the network but uh, the key that we we have. And here's an example of it here. So if you were obviously um, a, a red teamer or some type of offensive security person and you were assessing a ton of networks and you were running this script and <clears throat> just letting it assess 
against all the different networks it could find, it would be generating, assuming it's cracking the, the PSKs associated with these networks, it would be generating these outputs and then you as the assessor could go back through and see which networks had weak uh, pre-shared keys and that you would tell your, your customer, hey, um, it's trivial to get access to your wireless network. Uh, you need to come up with a better uh, pre-shared key or, or other, other security parameters for, for your Wi-Fi network. Now, with this information, you as the, the assessor, um, you know how to access this wireless network. So you could decide to associate with that wireless network. You know the SSID. Uh, you know, it's this GLAR152BE. You know the key. And now you could join that network. And assuming that it offers DHCP, you could get an IP address. And now you're just someone who's on that network. Now, there's ways potentially to frustrate someone joining in that manner. Uh, there could be some type of network access control. You might find yourself on a segment that doesn't have access to a whole lot of other systems, whatever the case may be. But uh, clearly getting you know, actual authenticated access to somebody's Wi-Fi in an unauthorized manner is uh, really difficult. Now, I'm not saying you should do that as unauthorized. Clearly, if you're doing a, a wireless assessment, you're authorized to be there, but you're impersonating an unauthorized party. And again, this attack succeeds because you're capturing the EA poll traffic that the scripts need in order to perform a brute force attack against the key and give that information to the assessor. And you can see that for um, the first system here, I was able to get all four messages. For the second system, I was missing message three or four, but because they're both using the same pre-shared key. I only need one system out of however many are attached. And in this case, there were two. You could imagine if there are 100 systems, you're going to get at least one of those systems. Um, and this script relies on uh, deauthenticating systems. In other words, knocking them off the network. And then as they reconnect, you grab that information. By the way, um, I learned a lot about different uh, T-Shark filters while doing this presentation. And so they're all included here. And I, like I said, I'll try to make this presentation available because being able to copy and paste some of these um, T-Shark filters is, you know, might be helpful for you. You know, the MAC address isn't going to be the same, but, um, you know, using WLAN.adder or EAPOL or some of these other more complicated ones, like, like passing a, a, an actual key uh, to T-Shark is, is pretty helpful. So this was a, a kind of a nice uh, learner experience for me as well. And um, I hope to share that with you. Okay. So in order to accomplish this activity, I had to put the NIC, or at least the script I was using, had to put the NIC into monitor mode. When you're using a, a, a wireless device, like a laptop, and it has a NIC and it just associates with a wireless network and you're using it like a normal user, you're in something called managed mode. But in order to see all of the traffic that's in your local area, in order to you know, find a, an access point to associate with, in order to see that type of uh, wireless control traffic, and then uh, the underlying traffic, um, the NIC needs to be put into something called monitor mode. And this is really where all of the limitations around various wireless NICs derive. If you look online, uh, the best location I found for information on which NICs to use are, are in YouTube videos. Um, there aren't as many people writing blog posts these days about what tends to work uh, for various network security assessment projects, but there are a lot of people doing videos and the videos, you know, they're doing them for the likes and for the ad revenue, and as a result, they'll post, um, you know, various people will post their results every few months and say, hey, here are the wireless NICs that are working best for my red teaming activity. And uh, you know, I was able to uh, confirm some of what I was doing by, by virtue of, of some of these videos. And so they'll talk about that you need to be able to have a NIC that can go into monitor mode. And if it can't go into monitor mode, you're not going to be able to perform the types of attacks um, that we, we just showed. And, and monitor mode was supposedly the key to being able to monitor network traffic on a wireless network. And we'll see whether or not if that's the case. Uh, if you want to switch between monitor and managed mode, I have the command listed here. So here's an example where uh, I, I did a sudo iwconfig in the name of the wireless interface and put it into mode managed. And you can see that the mode has now changed into managed. <clears throat> and if I want to go back to monitor mode, I just change managed to monitor and uh, the mode is now monitor. Now, sometimes you'll see people say you need to, to 
send the nick down, change the mode, bring the nick back up. That that can be true. Um, you may also find that monkeying around with the wireless nick, um, performing a lot of this activity, may start to result in the nick not behaving as you would expect it to. Uh, if that becomes the case, and I did see that at least once doing during my testing, um, something as simple as uh, disconnecting the NIC uh, in, in uh, VirtualBox might be helpful, or potentially disconnecting the NIC in VirtualBox and physically unplugging it so that it loses power and then you plug it back in and powers back up and you, uh, you'll find probably that'll take care of, of the issue. Okay, so the next uh, sort of wrinkle to this was trying to see if I could now simulate being on a wired network and having a system uh, watch traffic on a NIC. And I wanted to do this manually. I didn't want to do this using the native, uh, you know, double click on an icon and ch pick a network. I wanted to do this all manually. So if someone wanted to replicate it in exactly the same way, they could do that here. And so um, you'll see the NIC is, is in managed mode because we're going to be associating ourselves with the wireless network. Uh, and then I used uh, some tools associated with WPA su uh, Supplicant. And WPA Supplicant is going to be handling the negotiations and the association to an access point for us. So the first thing I had to do was I had to create a configuration file that had the pre-shared key in the proper format to be used by WPA Supplicant. Uh, so you'll see that I have that here using this uh, WPA passphrase program and I pass it the uh, SSID and I pass it the pre-shared key uh, and then it generates this uh, value here in this file. This is my WPA supplicant. Uh, and then I run that uh, WPA supplicant program and I give it the name of my configuration file and my wireless interface and you'll see that I'm able to connect to this wireless network. Um, now uh, unless I run this in the background this is going to take over the terminal that I'm using so I'll need a second terminal uh, in order to uh, interface with the system. Um, keep in mind that I'm doing this remotely, so I'm doing this through the so-called wired interface on this virtual machine. You could be typing straight into the virtual machine, but I tend to never do that. So I'm doing most of my control of the system via SSH, via another interface that was actually the ETH0 interface from the beginning of the video. Um, so I had to open a second terminal in order to do the, the commands that come next. So when I, when I have um, myself uh, associated with this wireless network. You'll see that if I do an IF config, there's my interface. Uh, notice it is running in promiscuous mode, so that's kind of, that's kind of interesting. Uh, but then my IW config shows that I'm now associated with this GL AR 152BE network. I'm in managed mode. And uh, at this point, I can actually try doing my first test of monitoring a wireless network. And in this case, I'm simply going to use TCP dump to capture traffic against this wireless interface and I'm going to write the data to this uh, file and we'll see what we get. Now in the spirit of showing data in several different formats uh, here I'm trying a more of a little more of a graphical approach. So this is a screen capture of the protocol hierarchy statistics of that PCAP that was captured by me being connected to a wireless network uh, no IP address essentially, uh, initially. Um, it's not necessary because if you were sniffing on a on an interface as a NSM person, you don't necessarily need an IP address. Um, <clears throat> but this is the traffic that was seen here uh, via Wireshark, and I'm going to use T Shark uh, in a few minutes later. Um, but one of the things you'll notice is that all of this traffic is uh, broadcast variety. Um, the, the easiest way to verify that that's the case is to quick, quickly take a look and see if there's any TCP traffic. Um, you know that TCP uh, is is not broadcast, uh, and I don't have any TCP traffic. And I, I find it highly unlikely that there would be no TCP on a network that I'm monitoring. Um, so this is uh, this is a little suspicious. And uh, just taking a look in a different method, this is a Wireshark. Uh, rendition of some of the traffic on there and again you can see all the traffic is destined for broadcast addresses whether they be um, IPv6, IPv4, etc. So this kind of tells you maybe what you were expecting that if you are sniffing a wired network 
and you are simply looking at the port that you have connected to a switch, for example, and you run TCP dump, you're only gonna see traffic destined to or from your device and any broadcast traffic. And this is essentially the same thing here with wireless traffic. You are watching traffic uh, to or from your device and any broadcast. Now, this device does not, this is a sniffing interface. I did not give it an IP address. It is not doing anything other than sniffing. So it will see only the broadcast traffic. And that's what we have here. Um, now, network security monitoring, it, just watching broadcast traffic is not sufficient. This may be the reason why some people think, oh, look at all this traffic I'm seeing. I just, I just sniff an interface and I see all this traffic. Well, a quick tip or a quick tri uh, trick if you ever want to find out if you're seeing traffic beyond uh, just what's destined to your system. Um, first of all, make sure you're not sniffing uh, on an interface that has an IP address. And then secondly, look for TCP traffic. And if you don't see any TCP, you're not seeing essentially somebody uh, else's traffic. I hope that makes sense. Um, if that didn't make sense, please let me know in the comments and we'll, we'll clarify it. Okay. So at this point, this is where I'm sure anyone who's still with me is saying, just use monitor mode. Put your NIC into monitor mode and you'll see all this traffic. And all right, let's see if we can see what we can see. Now, just going back to, to show our interface, you see we're in uh, manage mode. And now I'm going to use airmon-ng to uh, provide some uh, investigation of, of traffic. And I'm going to use the Airmon ng check command to make sure that I don't have any of the uh, background processes running on this, this virtual machine that might interfere with it, like something that would try to uh, manage the interface for me. So I make sure that uh, there's nothing running. If there was anything running, I would use the uh, Airmon ng check kill command. Uh, but we're, we're cool here. Next thing I do is I use the Airmon ng start and then the wireless interface and I put the interface into monitor mode and you can see here uh, monitor mode is enabled and I do another IW config command and yes monitor mode is enabled. Now here's where the magic starts. Um, I'm going to use airdump ng tell it the interface I want to watch and then I'm going to write traffic to a file. Technically, you don't have to do that, but I think this is probably one of the best features or one of my favorite features of Aerodump NG is that, yes, you can get results uh, when you're doing uh, Aerodump, but uh, it's wonderful to be able to write those results to files, and you'll also get a file of the uh, wireless traffic that was observed written in PCAP format so you can run other tools against it. So this is perfect for our purposes as uh, network security monitoring professionals. And as a result, you can see I just ran for five minutes. Um, you know, there's a bunch of other networks that were observed, which I've tried to obscure here. Here is our target network. And uh, the whole time that this thing is running, it's hopping among different channels, because that's the thing to realize. All this stuff is in the air. I mean, this is, this is RF we're dealing with. So we've got different activity over different frequencies, and you just can't watch all of it. So the way the, the monitoring works is the NIC is hopping from channel to channel. And when it's on a certain channel, it grabs traffic and then it hops to another channel and it grabs traffic and it just keeps doing that, uh, cycling through different elements of the, the uh, 2.4 gigahertz and the five gigahertz uh, channels. Well, they're around those, those channels. You know, you know, it's not exactly at, at any one of those. Now, uh, once I'm done, or I, I decide to stop collecting that traffic, and I run a, a quick uh, T-Shark stats or protocol hierarchy statistics, and uh, by the way, this is how you do it in T-Shark. Um, you do dash Q to turn off the display of all the traffic, and you do dash Z space IO comma PHS. That'll give you a protocol hierarchy statistics. And this is essentially a summary uh, protocol-wise of the wireless traffic that was seen in this, uh, this particular instance. Now, um, here I've done something that took me a little bit of time to figure out how to do, but it's really pretty, pretty helpful. What I did was I figured out, or I didn't figure out, I just learned by looking online, uh, how to pass the, the key and the SSID to T-Shark to do decryption of the traffic that it could decrypt with this information. And once you do that, um, and you do a protocol hierarchy, hierarchy statistics, um, you'll get 
other traffic, right? You won't just see the wireless traffic, you'll see what's carried within that wireless traffic, whether it's IP, UDP, ICMP, et cetera, which is great from our perspective. This, you know, this is looking kind of promising. Now, uh, the next thing I did was I decided to just run um, T-Shark against this traffic and pass it the IP parameter after I had done all of the decryption that was available. And by running the IP parameter, I'm not going to see the, the stuff that was just wireless, um, so things that couldn't be uh, decoded or whatever. Um, but, you know, either it's going to be straight up IP because it was in the clear as IP. Uh, I mean, it's still within the wireless traffic, but uh, it was not encoded. And uh, just in my local neighborhood, I did see at least one network that was using WEP with, with no encryption. So, you know, I didn't look at it, but um, that made me think, you know, who knows, that could, that could be another security person just seeing who's out there uh, uh, running a test or whatever. Um, but this screen that you see here, this is all of the IP traffic that was found in this trace collected over a five minute period. And I showed you how I had those two laptops that were running uh, ping. Uh, one, the left one was pinging the right one, and the right one was pinging the access point. And out of all that activity that went on for five minutes with ICMP running, you know, every second it's pinging something, this is the only capture of that I, I got. And you actually take a look at the sequence numbers, which is kind of interesting. Um, that gives you an idea of how long this thing had been running. Um, beyond that, this is other traffic that I got. So clearly, we're not, we're not, you know, just putting monitor mode on and sniffing traffic and then passing a decryption key, that doesn't give you a whole lot. In fact, it gives you enough to look like you're seeing something and to possibly lull you into a false sense of security that you're actually doing wireless monitoring. And you're not at all. You are basically just looking at a subset of activity. Okay, now some of you might say, well, you need to pay attention to the channel of interest or the network of interest. And if you're hopping all over the place, of course you're not gonna get the traffic you want. Well, that's a good point. So let's see what happens when we we uh, pay a little bit closer attention. So Aerodump NG has this nice feature where you can pass it the channel that you want to watch and you can pass it a uh, the MAC address of the network that you're interested in. Uh, and then I pass it my wireless interface and I tell it where I want to write the traffic to. And as you can see here in the output for it, uh, it's looking at channel six and it's only noticing the access point and two stations. These are the two uh, laptops, incidentally, that are connected to it. So this is this is you know, pretty good. Um, I, I posted in Twitter um, earlier this month when I was doing the work on this, whether or not this was a display filter or a capture filter. Uh, I didn't get any helpful responses to that. So the, the question is still open on this, whether it is simply a capture filter or display filter. Based on this work, I'm leaning a little bit more toward, toward it being a capture filter and not a display filter, but um, the jury is still a little bit out on that. Now, once I, I captured here for 15 minutes and uh, I did my protocol hierarchy, hierarchy statistics, you'll see I got many more frames than I did the last time, which is, which is good news. Um, and when I passed the encryption keys to this and did my protocol hierarchy statistics, I got a lot more stuff. And significantly, I got TCP traffic. So this is great. This, this is really promising here because um, if I'm seeing TCP traffic, I'm not just seeing broadcast. So this is a really great sign. So you can see I've got some HTTP here. Uh, I've got TLS. Um, so this is this is looking really good. Like, whoa, could there be something to this? You you run monitor mode. You look at a specific network of interest, and then potentially you could watch the watch what's happening and be able to um, uh, use it for security purposes. So let's see if if this is the case. Um, <clears throat> so one of the problems I had was that the file that you get uh, doesn't. You know, isn't written in a, a manner that can just be processed by regular tools. It's still got all of the radio headers around it. Uh, in other words, I just can't pass this trace that it was that was captured by AeroDump NG. I just can't give it to a tool like um, 
uh, well, even TCP dump, but I can't give it to, to uh, Zeek because it's just going to be a bunch of radio headers around the information of interest. And by the way, it's going to be encrypted. But thankfully, um, the Aircrack project ships a program called AirDecap-NG, which will essentially, if you give it the, the, um, the key information here, uh, it will strip the, the encryption and it will produce a clean PCAP for you to work with. So that's what I did. Um, the original PCAP was this one here. Um, once I ran AirDecap-NG against it, I got uh, this new file. And if you want to learn more about that, you can check it out on the uh, Aircrack NG documentation. So we're at the point where we have a PCAP that we could process through a tool like Zeek. And we'll see what's inside. So um, the original PCAP had uh, 5,780 IP frames. This new PCAP has 5,642, or actually... Uh, the new one has uh, 5,441 IP frames. So there are fewer IP frames in this. Um, this is focused on that particular network of interest. I'm wondering, I, I don't really know what to think about this, honestly. Um, I mean, there's plenty of data here for us to look at for the purposes of this experiment, but I don't exactly know what happened to that other IP traffic. Um, it doesn't appear that it's from another network. It's kind of what I thought it might be, but... Uh, I'm at the point where I needed to get this video out, so here we are. Uh, if this is a mystery that anyone wants to work on, please help me out. I'd appreciate any comments that you might have. Um, but for now, this is what we've got to work with. So we're at the point where finally we can read this trace using uh, a tool that will produce Zeek data. And I ran it through Brim. And uh, you know, the first thoughts were, you know, were, okay, maybe this is going to be something useful because there's TCP traffic in it. That means it wasn't just seeing broadcast traffic. But immediately, I saw something which was just absolutely horrifying. Uh, and that was a capture loss log and a notice based on the capture loss log. And the notice log said, the capture loss script detected an estimated loss rate above 86.115%. So we're seeing packet loss exceeding 86%, which is horrific. Um, the, the capture loss script does its work by analyzing TCP sequence numbers. And by the fact that I had uh, TCP traffic in this trace, Corla, or, uh, Zeke could take a look at the TCP sequence numbers and identify that, wow, yeah, I'm doing, I see huge chunks of traffic missing from your TCP data. And the TCP, by the way, was, was generated on the laptops. I did things like visit websites. Um, uh, I FTP'd uh, to, the, I think, the freebsd.org uh, FTP site, pulled down an index file. I tried to do different activities that would generate traffic that might be interesting. Uh, and, of course, we had the two laptops pinging each other and a laptop pinging the, the gateway and so forth. So what does this tell you? This tells you that this approach of just running monitor mode, even when you focus on a network of interest, is completely not useful for network security monitoring purposes. Uh, at best, you will get a flavor of what is happening on this network. But in a situation where you're having exceed, you know, in excess of 86% packet loss, it's almost worthless. Um, there's lots of activity that there is just no mention of it here for example i told you the the ftp to the ft uh the uh, freebsd ftp server no mention of it at all um, most of the web browsing i did there's not a single record of it whatsoever now if you had been monitoring the north south traffic from this wireless network using conventional means such as a network tap or a span port uh, at a place uh, on a wired network then yeah you would have a record of this um, but you do not get <laughs> really much of use here for a true network defender professional approach to monitoring a wireless network in the sense of watching wireless to wireless or watching wireless to wired as a, in a north-south uh, environment. So that is my take on uh, wireless monitoring for, for network security monitoring purposes. And uh, if you watch this video, you made it all the way through. I appreciate it. If you, along the way you, you decided I had no idea what I was talking about and I'm missing something fundamental, uh, 
please uh, let me know because it would be great for us to be able to do network security monitoring against wireless systems talking to each other or talking to another network and to make it as easy as sniffing a span port or the output from a tap. My preliminary um, conclusion is that it does not work that way. Now, perhaps there's some specialized hardware that might do this. If you had a, a specialized access point that provided a, a span port on the access point, that would do it because uh, in a wireless network, essentially, all devices are talking to the wireless access point, even when they're talking to each other. So if you have a way on your access point to provide, essentially, a span port, then you, you'll be okay. Um, there may also be some other methods, perhaps using like RSpan or, or some other things that I learned years ago when, with my CCNA, but I've since forgotten. But in terms of being able to set up a, a system running Linux, putting a NIC into uh, wireless uh, monitor mode as you would if you were attacking a network, it just does not work the same for defensive purposes. And uh, this is my best guess, or this is my best uh, assessment of how to do that, how to make it uh, in a manner that you could repeat. And if you want to give it a try, please let me know if you have different hardware that you want to use, different operating system, different commands, whatever it is, give it a, give it a shot, let me know. Um, as always, the easiest way to get in touch with us in the Zeke uh, project is probably to use the Slack channel. We do have uh, uh, email as well that we, we respond to, but honestly, Slack is something that I've just, I spend a lot of time in checking out what's going on with the community and uh, hope to hear from you. So I hope you found this edition of uh, Zeke in Action helpful. Um, I have been your host, Richard Baitlick, and I hope you'll join me for the next video.